Hello and welcome back to the channel, it's Mark from PowerSonic and Apprentice One to One. Today we're going to have a look at the new solar roof you'll see behind me. Still to get the panels on, I'm going to explain all of that in just a minute. You can see we've moved where we wasn't originally going to install it. Let's take a look inside, we're going to have a look at some containment as well, putting some steel conduit and trunking up. Let's get to it. Okay, let's have a wander inside and see what we've got set up in here. So you can see we've got some steel containment around the top. I'll show how this has been installed by the guys so you can see how, how they've done it. But essentially it's a straight run of 50 by 50 trunking around the top. We've got a pre-manufactured bend in the corner there. And it just runs down to the end here with end caps in. And then we've dropped down with some steel conduit to the various accessories. So we've got mainly sockets and the one spare just there for a heater if and when we ever decide to put one in. Um, essentially, this is going to be a space for people to come and make their own mark on. So we've got a box full of compact RCBOs from Proteus. And again, we bought those. It's not been donated. None of this stuff has paid for everything. And we're all set up in here now, ready for the solar system to go on top. We've popped the cinema chairs in for the moment. These just lift in and out so we can put them around the place based on what we're doing. Idea is when we're kind of having people in, it's somewhere to sit and chill out a little bit, but also recording the podcast. If we have people come in to record episodes with us, it's a nice little setup, I think, to pop into position. We'll probably most likely do it out in the booths. But for the minute, we've popped them in here, because um, why not? We've got a load of the books all here, as I show in this video. We're going to reference into the, uh, the bonding guidance note 8 with what we're doing here. But it is important, I think, to try and link these books into practical application in the real world. It's one of the things I'm trying to do with my own YouTube channel and Apprentice One to One. So we want to kind of link in all this stuff. We've got the electric vehicle code of practice, we've got the design guide, we've got all of the um, student guide to the wiring regs, building regs, emergency lighting, temporary installations, all the NAPIT books in there. So you've got your code breakers, your initial verification on-site solutions, the whole, whole shebang. And we want to link that into actual installation work and how it references in with the day job and what we do. These lights are colour changing. This is just a bit of a, a gimmicky feature that serves no purpose whatsoever. But if we want, we can turn the lights to different colours. So yeah, could have a little disco in here perhaps. Um, don't know why, why we did that to be honest, but that's what we've done. Bit of fun. Out in the um, booths themselves. So we've got this one now, there's, there's power into here now. Obviously it's not connected, but we've got our feed down, ready to connect into this main um, connection point up here and then we've got the BMS panel waiting to go in once I get sorted with Eddie. He has been in touch, Eddie Clemens, about doing all of this but we're that busy with everything else that's going on at the minute. Uh, it's on the back burner, we'll get to that soon. You see we've got here, this is the EV bay. This is where we're going to site the battery. So we're going to put a battery for the solar panels in here. You'll see me mention that on the other video. We was talking of putting the panels across up here. Changed my mind from all of that and we've stuck them on a new build, especially designed for it over there so the battery will be living in that building along with the inverter and everything else so it's not going to be in here now but this can become an EVSE bay so we're going to put an electric vehicle charge point in we can do a load of testing on it we can explain all of the earthing arrangements you need to consider and everything else around there we've got some posters in production ready to go up explaining all of that same for the BMS stuff we've got posters as alongside the um, installation stuff inside here this is the the commercial three phase kind of installation works. So we've got our lights up now. We've got our boards in. This is all powered and energized. So we've got single phase, three phase Snyder ice of our P boards, a couple of sockets dotted in. And again, it's just here for someone to come in and work with a bit of containment, wiring final circuits to these boards and get a bit of experience working in those environments, seeing how metering kits, for example, um, work. So you can see we've got that energized and the metering kits in how you would connect all of that up just stuff you might not get experience of we've got the power tags as well so we can look at those on the scope demonstrate a bit of safe isolation and then we have this booth which at the minute has just got a lot of the older switch gear that we've been collecting up on the wall so we've mounted that just to demonstrate what some of the older stuff looked like and how you would work on maintaining it and then we're going to set up a more domestic based area here so you can see we've got the Luden board few circuit accessories. For those of you who followed the channel for a while, you'll recognize all that lot because it's off the test board, which is down there. The original board of fun and pain that I built probably three years ago now. And we've repurposed it onto this wall, but we need to get set up and get that wired in. We've got the cable jacks, steel bender, and all the 
tools and everything in there. That's ready for the next college drop. So for those of you who follow my social media, you'll have seen I went to St. Helens College maybe three or four weeks ago now. Dropped a load of that stuff in and this is for Milton Keynes. So we've got a load of circuit accessories, some of the donated stuff from eFix. We've got bits from Schneider, bits from Napier, bits from TIS. Um, we've got bits from Martindale, um, Electrical Industries Charity. Loads of stuff in there ready to go and drop off and there's more to come as well. There's stuff still on the way. So it's nice to be able to support colleges with bits and pieces like that. But let's get on with the video. That's showing you around this. Let's see it been put together and what it is exactly we're doing. So inside this room, we are gonna kit it out in metal clad accessories and some steel containment. This is all adaptable for other people coming in to do things in the future, but we wanted to do a base install to give people an idea of you know how you can approach these things. We're using um, lock rings and nipples on this one rather than bush and couplers. And you'll see a bit more of that later on in this installation. You can see Nathan's getting the saddles marked out here. So again, he's measured the distance between the accessory and the trunking, and he's gonna put the appropriate number of saddles in place on each drop. Got some over here already done, and they're nicely locked into position. So we're ready to start drawing cable down that one. But before we pull any cable into the containment system, it's important to get it in place in full. So if you're ever approaching a job like this, always say get all of your containment ready and finished before you even start drawing any cables through as tempting as it sometimes can be to start getting bits and pieces drawn in through the the system it's a lot easier and simpler if you've got everything in place and finished and you can see we're running here from a proteus twin stacked consumer unit so it's just going to be a single phase system inside this room we have got some m2 circuit accessories so they're the metal clad back boxes that we're just getting onto the wall there. And this is the Tamlex trunking and steel tube, which we've popped down to these accessories. So you can see Nathan has got the saddles on now and he's in position to put this last one down at the bottom. And this one is using the impact driver. So he's got the impact driver, popped a screw and a washer through the center hole. Actually, I don't think there will be a washer on this because it's um, a tight fit just to get the screw head in. You can see he's popping that in onto position here. And it's just a simple case of fastening it along the laser line dead in the center. We do have markings down these walls from the plasterboard in already. So it was reasonably straightforward to follow, but it's always best to make sure you are properly level and square as Nathan has done there. So you can see with this one, he's marking and measuring for the entry hole into the trunking. Now you can do this with little tricks using saddles and couplers or a length of tube and mark the hole center onto the trunking. But my preferred method is always to take a measurement and mark it onto the containment. That's the way I've always done it. And I think it's as good as any, it's as fast as any other method in my opinion. And you can see here Nathan's got the Armeg um, hole cutter. This one is blunting quite a bit, so it's going to be a bit of a struggle for it getting through. We was um, using its last little bit of life on this job. So you can see he's very carefully making sure he's got things centered where he wants it. And then it's just a case of persevering. And Nathan is taking the mick here with his PPE in a very deliberate attempt to trigger me, I think. But I ignored him. So he's there with his safety goggles on and his face shield. But um, better safe than sorry, I suppose. And you can see he's got the hole through there now and we're ready to start popping the tube in. Now, as I said, with this one, we're using the, the nipples that screw into the containment. So in this case, they're screwing into the coupler there up into the fitting and there is a lock ring on the underneath. And you can see he's loosening that lock ring off and just turning the nipple in as far as he can get it inside that tube and that's to remove as much of the metal work from inside the back box as possible. Now you can use a, a double lock ring on this. Sometimes you'll still have a little bit of the metal exposed. So if you're wanting to cover that up, another lock ring over the top can do so. It's not really necessary in my opinion, but if you wanted to do that, the option is there. And once you've got that nipped up to a point by hand, you can then get some pliers um, or a water pump spanner onto it and just nip it up a bit to give you that nice solid connection on the containment. Now you see with these, once you do come to connecting your circuit accessories, there is lots of earth connections within this containment system by default. So you're gonna to wanna to think about the earth and arrangements on the containment itself. Now with this one, it's not forming any part of being a circuit protective conductor because you can set the circuits up in that way as well if you wish. 
but it will by default become an extraneous conductive part. So we need to think about that and we'll have a little look in the books and speak about that later in the video. You can see Nathan's just getting the saddle tops on. So again, you just get those into position, screw them down nice and tight and that ensures the tube can't fall out onto anything or anyone. And it's locked in position nice and secure. You can see with these, um, I would normally loosen one side off and take the, nut, uh, the sorry the bolt out on the other to then fasten it around as Nathan did there. You can see we're pulling our singles in, dropping down each tube into the sockets along our radial. So it is a radial circuit. You'll see this last socket here is end of line. We've also pulled our conductors through and into the light switch. And Nathan's got those cables back into the consumer unit. You can see he's dressed those away into a couple of breakers. We are going to expand on this. We'll have a look at that later on in this video as well. But this is the Proteus twin stack board. Loads of options for us in how we're going to approach laying it out. It is a small sub main down to here. For those of you who followed the other vi videos, you will realize the booths have a limited capacity and this is never going to be a used or functional system in this room. It is just for demonstration and practicing purposes. So you can see we've got that wired up there. We've popped a little socket in underneath just as a convenient place to gather test measurements. And we've got the front covers on all the circuit accessories around the room as well. You'll note we've gone for these little floodlights in here. That is basically because they can be adjusted in the color output. So we can do some funky things with filming maybe later on inside here as a little side uh, benefit to the wiring system we've put into place. And they're connected into a junction box here within the trunking and we'll demonstrate that as well later on in the video. These M2 accessories are actually really good, the way the front covers line up with the back boxes. They sit very nicely into position while you get the front cover screws on. They look really good externally and really simple to install. So we'll see how they go in the long term. Overall, I think that's come out quite well. So I just wanted to show some of the different overcurrent protective devices on this Proteus board. So this is the twin stacked version, 22 way. You can see the way it's set up here. Straight out of the box, this is how it came aside from the three vinyl circuit um, you'll see that are in there. So we've got the main switch, and again the SPD is all pre-wired in the board. This one is a Type 2 SPD, and you see down here it loops across to this bottom buzz bar via a connection block, and we're on to another 12 ways down on the bottom half of this board. The unique features of these Proteus MCBs and RCBOs is they actually go on this front buzz bar, as I would call it, rather than in a cage clamp, it's sitting behind the screw head and you t it's impossible to enter those onto that bar incorrectly because they don't actually lock on underneath the DIN rail. You'd have to actually um, pull them up so if you see on the back there, they're not locked in aside from the way how they fasten on to the board. And I'll show you that in a second. We'll remove one and I'll demonstrate exactly what I mean. You see there we've got the tall RCBO on the right. So this is one of the older varieties, that one's a 10KA version, so you typically use that in a commercial board. We've then got a normal MCB just next to it, and lastly, one of the compact RCBOs that we'll have a look at in a minute and explain exactly what they do. But just to show the form factors inside this board, you can see obviously the tall RCBO is quite substantially larger, whereas the mini RCBO is pretty much the same size as the MCB, um, both in the way it fits onto the DIN rail and buzz bar and its overall shape. So that's good to know. We've just fixed this onto the wall temporarily because this is going to be on and off for people to come and work on and install. So we've got a little bit of tube up to the top there. There's a wider video around all of this which will show you it's been installed. But just to cover off the board, we'll have a little look at the RCBO and then talk about the rest of the install in just a minute. So just to cover off the removal of the RCBO, so it works for all these devices, simply loosen the front screw and then it will just lift out. It doesn't actually lock itself into position underneath, it's fastening itself on this front screw. So if it, if it moves about, you know you've not got it on there right, whereas the cage clamp method, sometimes you can miss it and you've got to check very carefully with other brands because it would lock on to the underside of the DIN rail um, and you can have it feel secure whilst it's not actually connected but that one's easy to remove. So looking in guidance note eight, which is earthing and bonding, we can find the answer to the question on the steel containment in here. I think I mentioned extraneous conductive parts earlier on in the video. It's actually exposed conductive parts um, for the steel trunking and steel conduit. As it says in this book, it did used to be a case that lots of designers would have used the steel conduit and ducting as the earth itself, so the CPC. Times have changed now. It actually says in here that it's fallen out of favor and people tend to use a CPC in addition 
to the containment system itself these days and that's consistent with a lot of installs you'll find that are out there you tend to find a separate CPC is now drawn through the containment to all of the accessories but because this does form an exposed conductive part it still does need to be earthed that's an important factor to remember it will be picking lots of that up through all of the accessories which have their terminations fastened back into the back box earth lugs and also through the retaining screws on the front covers because those of you who work with metal clad accessories as part of steel containment systems will realise that they are both fixed lugs. So they're going to have a good solid earthy connection, they're generally bolted together very firmly as you will have seen with Nathan's efforts in this video. We've used the um, lock rings and removed some of the covering internal to the back box so they're getting a really good bite on there. Same in the distribution board consumer unit. We have got a lock ring in there with an earth fly lead up to it. So we've got that really solid earth connection all the way through the system. We can test that in later videos and see some of the continuity we have running through that. Um, but it's the same with the trunking. It's actually quite interesting if you look inside this um, book without getting into all of the regulations around when and where you can't use the containment or as your um, CPC. But it does help you calculate the CSA of the trunking. So in this case, we've got um, 20 mil trunking. It actually, sorry, conduit. It actually says that comes out to around 83 square millimeters CSA in terms of its size, which is immense really, because you know we've just got a 2.5 mil CPC running through there alongside all of this linked together. So obviously that's providing a much um, larger earth path than the CP itself, CPC itself running through it. With trunking, so with this it is 50 by 50 trunking, it's saying that that has a CSA of 135 millimetres. Now with these you've got a reference into the manufacturer's data sheets to see if they need any additional earth straps where you've got your pre-manufactured bends. That's one of the reasons that a lot of designers like to use those pre-manufactured bends because they know exactly when they're put together that they're going to get the continuity through the earthing system that they need rather than people who may have fabricated them themselves and obviously there's differences in how that's approached and the end result um, of such. So it says here, as previously mentioned, irrespective of whether steel conduit is used as a CPC or not, the conduit itself is required to be earthed. It's therefore essential that all the joints in the conduit are mechanically robust and electrically sound. This requires that the screw joints in the system, the conduit couplers and the conduit boxes are cleaned before tightened. Similarly, bushes and couplers used for terminating the steel conduit into accessory boxes and the like are required to be tightened by the use of the correct tool. The conduit system is required to be selected with reference to the environmental conditions. Black enamel and galvanized steel conduit are available, respectively for use in dry and other conditions. For various arduous duties, stainless steel conduit is also available. So those of you who work with stainless steel, you will know that that is not a fun material to work with, but it looks amazing when it is done. And this is just galved here, so Obviously we're inside, it's in a controlled environment, it's going to be changing off the wall like nobody's business, so it's not really a factor for us in terms of the environmental conditions for corrosion, um, but it does need to be hard wearing and in this case it ticks that box for us. Now while we're talking about uh, metal containment, I think we should mention tray and basket, so we'll just zoom across, I think it's section 10 in here, yeah it's uh, 10.11, it talks about cable tray and basket. So it says a cable tray or cable basket where used as a support and cable management system has to be considered in the context of earthing and bonding. In other words, are such systems where consisting of metal or plastic coated metal, exposed conductive parts or extraneous conductive parts, consequently do they require earthing or bonding? So that's the question it's asking. So it first addressed the question of earthing and whether the cable tray or basket should be earthed. There's electrical equipment such um, as your mineral insulated cables without an overall PVC covering are laid on it. So it says exposed conductive parts of cables such as copper sheathed or mineral insulated cables are required to be connected to the MET of the installation, so your main earthing terminal, um, by a CPC designed to conduct earth fault currents. The cable tray basket to which the sheathed mineral insulated cable is attached or may be in contact is not itself an exposed conductive part and therefore does not require earthing. To do so would only serve to distribute further any touch voltage resulting from an air fault on an item equipment to which the cable was connected. And a cable compliant with an appropriate standard having a non-metallic sheath or a non-metallic enclosure is deemed to provide satisfactory basic protection and fault protection, as does an item of class 2 equipment. Um, hence the metal cable tray or basket need not be earthed. So it says here, generally the conductive parts of the metal cable tray or basket system need not be purposely earthed. 
Some conductive parts of a metal cable support system may be earthed, however, by virtue of fortuitous contact with exposed conductive parts. So that's other wiring systems, or even um, in terms of an extraneous conductive part, if it is on the steel frame of a building, for example, as well. So it says here where the installation designer has selected the cable tray for use as a protective conductor, which is permitted under certain regulations. Uh, it's described as an electrical continuous support system for conductors. The cable tray must meet the requirements of a protective conductor given in regulation 543.2.2 and will need to be connected with air. So in short, um, you don't need to do it. It says here as well that should the cable tray or basket be equipotentially bonded, it says unless the metal cable support system is liable to introduce a potential that does not already exist in the location in which the system is installed, it will not meet the definition of an extraneous conductive part. Consequently, in normal circumstances, there is no need for the conductive parts of the support system to be connected either to a protective bonding conductor or any supplementary bonding conductors. However, should the cable tray be installed in such a manner that it is likely to introduce a potential from outside of the location, thereby meeting the definition of an extraneous conductive part, then protective potential bonding will be required. For example, consider a run-up cable tray carrying services into a particular building. The cable tray may be in contact with earth potential outside a building and upon entering the building would likely to introduce that earth potential. In such case, the cable tray would meet the definition of an extraneous conductive part. So in general terms, you don't need to be earthing it, but say you've run some tray external to a building at low level and it's penetrated the fixings into the substrate and it's come into contact with an earth potential. It then passes into a building. You're gonna to need to treat that as if it was an extraneous conductive part and um, bond it as such. Generally, where tray and basket are used, it's unlikely that that's going to be the case, so you don't have to do it. You know, if you was to do it earlier, there's the issue of introducing touch potentials during fault conditions that otherwise wouldn't present themselves. But also, we know as installers how common is it to see um, cables laid on tray in particular, not so much basket, where they've had their outer sheath damaged, and they could then be putting those voltages onto the cable management system, as this book refers to, it, and it wouldn't operate any other current protected devices until such a time as somebody provided a path to earth for it. So I can see the benefits for doing it, and I know lots of installers do it by default anyway, but technically speaking, you don't have to. So I hope that answered that question in some way. It's guidance note eight for those of you who want to go and have a look at it. This is the, the blue version, obviously the original 18th edition um, version. I've not got the brown one with me. In the Apprentice One to One Academy, it's at the business for PowerSonic to make use of. So maybe I need to bring some of those books over. But that is the same in the brown version as it is the blue. Anyway, hope you found that interesting. Let's crack on with the video. Okay, so I did just want to have a quick look at the Proteus RCBO. Got it out of the box here. You see it comes in some cardboard packaging, no plastic inside it whatsoever, which is fantastic. Clearly states on the front that it's switch neutral. That's often a bugbear of installers of double pole switch neutral. What's it actually mean? And you know, what application can we use them in? Typically we're concerned about that because of EVSEs and the need to open both line and neutral um, for us to satisfy the regulations in context of, of that application. And these do that, that's the important part. So these from Proteus, you can see they're a very small form factor, just the same size as an MCB to be truthful. And this one is a 6KA variety, type B. I think it's, a, without my glasses, yeah, it's a B6. So that can go into this domestic twin stack board that I've got behind me here and help us with some of the stuff we're doing in the Apprentice One to One Academy. I don't just want to keep installing stuff in here to make videos because I'm conscious of wearing it out for those who are coming in to you know, get their training and make better use of it than I can. So I'm not going to go to that trouble, but you've seen me put them in the board just to show the difference in size. They have a nice long fly lead on and that can work both ways for installers. I've seen people getting frustrated when they're doing their commercial distribution boards and the fly leads are too short to reach the neutral bar. And equally, I've seen people getting very upset that they have to cut down every single fly lead in the small domestic bar just to reach into the neutral terminal bar or tuck everything behind the, the DIN rail with loads and unnecessary wire. You know, you can see that from a manufacturer's point of view. If you try to satisfy everyone, you have that many SKUs on the shelf, it gets very difficult. And um, it's just the easiest way to do it, in my opinion. The mild inconvenience of shortening the odd fly lead um, covers all the bases for them, really, in one product. So I totally get why they do that. I've got the test button on the top. So again, you've got traditional RCBO for those of you who use these. 
And yeah, main point is it's compact, fits in nicely, you've got your line and neutral in the top. I like the way it mounts onto the buzz bar so you know if it's in there or not. It does still have the traditional method of hooking onto a DIN reel that a lot of other overcurrent protected devices do, and you have got the cage clamp on the bottom still. So if you want to connect this onto a buzz bar in a different enclosure or a different Proteus product that happens to have a different um, connecting mechanism, then you can still do that. Um, just off the top of my head, I know there are some brands out there that don't have the switch neutral, so I'm thinking of the, the Hager RCBOs. Um, straight away, there are some older varieties as well from M2 that are just a single um, pole. You've got to be careful when you're ordering those because the newer variety of M2 RCBOs are the same as these where they do have that switch neutral, but just when you're ordering, make sure you're asking for the right one if that's the, the application you need. And yeah, just make sure whatever brand you're choosing, if you are using these on EVSEs or your PV and battery storage and you need to be opening both line and neutral, you get the right product for the job because it's an easy mistake to make. I've made it in the past and it's a pain in the backside. I can saw it out afterwards. You can see on the side there, we've got a diagram that clearly shows the line and neutral both been opened and there is QR codes to scan and go off and read the full data sheets on this product for those who need to. So it's still accessible to us as installers, but they are trying to cut down on a lot of the waste. You know what it's like. You get a tray full of RCBOs to install into a board. Every single one comes with a leaflet that explains what the product does. And 99 times in 100, they go in the bin. It's such a waste. So it's good to see a lot of manufacturers moving away from that and stopping wrapping every single component in the box in plastic as well. I think anything we can do, a simple thing like that, makes a big difference. As long as the product gets delivered to us safely and in one piece, which I think this cardboard packaging allows for, then that's um, to be applauded. But let's move on with the video. So I hope you enjoyed that look around the Apprentice One to One Academy and seeing the guys demonstrating some work with steel containment. Tried to cover off some of the technical aspects around that as well. So I hope that's of some value to you. We've got some exciting stuff coming here. Um, Dan from DMH, I think I mentioned in the video, is coming along to help us install the solar panels onto the roof. So he's a renewables expert. He's going to donate some rail and hooks, which is fantastic. And as I said, we've got some rafters that bolt alongside the structural ones. So we're not screwing in and out all the time, damaging the, the structure and having to rebuild the roof. We can just drop new bits of timber in um, for the next batch of build work um, on that roof structure. We're going to get some scaffold up there as well. So it's a real world environment for people lifting panels on and off. Getting a feel for how all of that works in a safe environment is exactly what we're trying to demonstrate here. And linking in some of the technical requirements in terms of regulations and compliance that we have to manage when we're installing PV, EV and battery storage. So that's one of the important factors of Apprentice One to One as well. Okay, so obviously we're on our own journey with PV installations um, in the day job at PowerSonic. So we're not in an expert position to offer that training ourselves, but the idea is we're gonna work alongside people who are. So there's experienced renewables installers who are gonna get involved and share some of their tips and tricks and demonstrate some of the installation nuances based on certain roof construction and such. Um, for other people to get a benefit from, including us. I think that's an important factor as times are changing now out in industry where we're moving towards this prosumerism at a domestic level and we've got the domestic electrician apprenticeship and there's such a focus on renewables within that. I think having the facility here in the Apprentice One to One Academy was a smart thing to do and it's hopefully going to benefit lots of people. Uh, we was just going to originally put it over the booths at the back of the um, bays there. But I, the more I thought about it and the more space I realised it was going to take up, it became obvious that was a silly idea. It was just trying to save cost, essentially, because we are on a limited budget. But I think building this dedicated structure and space for it all made a lot of sense in the long term. It does give the ability to offer a more real-world environment to the training as well. So that's where we've gone down that road. And the room underneath is for the battery storage and the inverters and everything. It's not a recording studio. Somebody did ask that on one of the social media posts. I guess because we put the cinema chairs in there. But they just move around the place based on when and where you want to use them. We put them in there to play with the, the lighting as I demonstrated and just have a sit down after we'd finished the, the install. And they've stayed in there ever since. But they will be moved back out to the booths when we're recording for the podcast because that's where we put them. A bit more of an interesting backdrop than just sat talking at my desk as I am here. Um, so yeah, they, they just move around and float about. But we will have the, the battery storage and the inverters in there. Solar panel storage as well. It can all go in that space and then people work safely out on the roof. And just a massive thanks to people who are showing that um, kindness towards the Apprentice One to One Academy. It is amazing. Dan from DMH offering 
you know, the installation of the rails and hooks and coming along and offering his expertise all for free. And we had One Stop Cable Shop send in some networking equipment. I've got a dedicated video on that coming soon. So they sent in some data cabling, keystones, and other bits and pieces along those lines. I won't go too much into detail with that here, but there is some content coming on that. And the gent from over on Twitter who's sending in a QTech MFT as well, they were just messaging me over the weekend. And stuff like that happens all the time. It's happened, you know, a couple of years now. And it just seems to be the way Apprentice One to One goes. People want to get involved and show a bit of kindness themselves through the mechanism that we've put in place in the Apprentice One to One community. And that's really nice. It's really humbling. And yeah, a huge thanks to the sponsors who are helping us with all of this. We wouldn't be able to offer it out to industry for free without them. And I'm very grateful. I know that the community of apprentices and retrainees out there are as well. And we hope to make the best use of that funding as we can through our efforts in the academy space and more widely out in social media, helping other colleges and training providers improve their facilities as well and you'll see some more content on all of that in the coming weeks and months as normal but yeah just massive thanks to everyone i hope you've enjoyed this video if you've got any questions in and around any of the content please do let me know um, if you want to put us right on something we've done wrong or bits and pieces you do different don't be afraid of offering those opinions as well it's all welcomed and um, yeah we'll see you on the next one if you haven't already please subscribe to the channel give us a thumbs up or a thumbs down if you've liked it and thank you very much for taking the time to watch.